John chapter 9, the account uh, of one of those occasions when Jesus healed the blind. Um, so I, I think uh, Jesus healed blind people more than any other physical ailment. Um, uh, you might argue the exception would be the lepers, um, because uh, sometimes there are groups of lepers uh, that came to him. But in, in terms of actual incidents, um, uh, there, there are these five incidents <clears throat> of where he heals the blind. And uh, so blindness has become this metaphor um, for uh, spiritual blindness um, and not being able to see the truth. And equally, of course, um, sight has become the metaphor for being able to see the spiritual truths that uh, Jesus came to reveal. <clears throat> and uh, so, uh, just to put this into context, though, before we read, because actually there is an ongoing confrontation that's taking place. Um, it starts uh, chapters earlier and it carries on chapters afterwards. Um, uh, there's this confrontation between Jesus and the religious leaders. They are looking for every possible excuse to arrest him, uh, and to have him executed. And this is part of the ongoing story. But to narrow that down just a little bit more, it's also part of the story of um, chapter 8. <clears throat> and uh, here in chapter 8, of course, we have the first time that Jesus declares himself to be the light of the world. And we find it in, in verse 12. And there he is... Um, uh, uh, speaking to the people, verse 12, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. The Pharisees challenged him, uh, it goes on to say. <clears throat> and uh, we've done quite a lot about the light just recently. And uh, as we were um, uh, going through Advent and Christmas, um, we looked at um, the word, the logos, um, the life and the light. So... I was kind of tempted, really, to, to kind of skip this one um, and, and move on to the next I am. Because we're going through these I am statements of Jesus. We started back in November uh, with I am the bread of life. Um, and uh, it was on the morning of the carol service that um, I was planning to do this one. Um, but, of course, we, we kind of changed the format a little bit um, as we had the carol service that day. And so we didn't get to do this properly. But, but I think it's appropriate to come back to it today. Um, and so I want to focus more on the second time that Jesus declares himself as the light. And uh, so we find that here in John chapter 9. So we're going to read from verses 1 to 12, and then we'll look at this passage. <clears throat> as Jesus went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said this, he spat on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. And this word means scent. And so the man went and washed and came home seeing his neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that it was, and others said, No, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes opened? they demanded. He replied, The man they called Jesus made some mud, put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. And so I went and washed, and then I could see. 
Where is this man? they asked him. I don't know, he said. We're going to leave the story there. Um, If you get a chance, I encourage you to read the rest of chapter 9 because it's all about, the whole of the chapter is all about this miracle that took place. And you'll find that it goes on to talk about um, really uh, the investigation um, into the healing. And the Pharisees, the religious leaders, are the ones who lead this investigation. But they themselves are blind anyway, so they really can't see anything. And so, but they are looking into this to try and find out how the man was healed. And, and uh, he says some comical things um, here. And you can kind of hear the frustration in their inquisition um, uh, as uh, they keep asking him the same questions over and over again. And he says, you know, I told you. And uh, um, I love it in, in verse 27 where he says uh, to them, he says, I told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Um, and and that, that really irked them. I mean, talk about, you know, ruffle the feathers. Um, you know, it says, they hurled insults at him. Um, uh, you know, you're this fellow's disciple? Um, he didn't even know who he was at that point. And then we get later on, towards the end of the chapter, that Jesus, uh, having heard what had happened with the Pharisees and the fact they got so angry they just threw him out of their presence, that he came and he sought him out a second time. Because actually think about this, that it was Jesus who saw him the first time. He obviously didn't see Jesus. Jesus saw him. Um, and Jesus found him the second time and uh, asked him that, that question, do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked Tell me that I may believe in him. Uh, You have now seen him. In fact, the one you are speaking with, that's him. The man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. So you can see that not only did he have his physical eyes open, but then he had his inner eyes open, his spiritual eyes. And he comes to Jesus. um, And uh, uh, seeing... So let's just talk a, a little bit um, uh, about, uh, well, I, I want to talk to begin with anyway, a, a little bit about some of the, the background to, to what's going on here. Um, Jesus, you know, he's already declared himself in the previous chapter, which is connected to this one. Uh, he's already declared himself to be the light of the world. The Pharisees challenged him. They didn't like what he said at all. Um, and they didn't like it for two reasons. Um, The first reason they didn't like it is because in claiming that he is light um, and that that through his teaching and the direction that he gave to the people, that he alone was the one who would lead others into the light. Now, that actually meant, of course, that uh, the Pharisees were leading people in darkness. And Jesus had said as much. Um, so the Pharisees didn't like this. This, this was casting uh, a cloud over them uh, and, uh, uh, and was, was influencing the people in how they viewed the Pharisees. In fact, the people had already said, Mark uh, records this beautifully, where he says that uh, the people were saying of Jesus, he teaches with authority, not as the teachers of the law. Uh, He teaches in a way that we understand, not as the teachers of the law. He teaches in a way that we can apply and makes a difference to our lives, not like the teachers of the law. We listen to them and it's it's just all gobbledygook. We don't understand what they're saying and and we can't do the things they ask us to do. And, uh, you know, it, it just doesn't work. But Jesus comes along and he declares himself to be the light. <clears throat> but there's a second thing that Jesus does, and it's a little bit subtle um, and would need a, a bit of explaining. And this isn't really the main emphasis of, of uh, the talk today. But remember that this is part of a series that we're doing here um, throughout uh, our Explore services on the I Am statements of Jesus. These are all recorded in John's Gospel. And they all start off with those words, I am. And this word, I am, is very important. Now, so we may not see it, but it's very important because it is in this context. Now, if you say it, it, it's a bit different, perhaps. Um, 
uh, you know, so, uh, so, 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 so I just want to make that, uh, that clear. But when Jesus says this in this context, he is saying he is God. It's a claim to deity. I am. How on earth can that be a claim to be God, you might uh, want to ask the question. And for that, you need to go all the way back to, uh, to Moses um, in Exodus chapter 3. Uh, and so this is not lost on the, these Pharisees, because in fact, these Pharisees, when um, they're talking to this man and inquiring of him, how, you know, who, who uh, opened your eyes, how did it happen, who, you know, and all these questions. And when he gets to that point <coughs> of saying, uh, do you want to become one of his disciples too? And they say to him, you're this fellow's disciples. And then they try and pull rank on him and say, we are the disciples of Moses. They knew everything that Moses had taught. They knew the law um, that came from Moses. But in the story of Moses, um, Moses, uh, you know uh, probably um, uh, quite well um, that Moses was, um, uh, you know, he was brought up in Egypt. Um, uh, and let's fast forward for a moment. Um, uh, he murders an Egyptian who was mistreating uh, an Israelite. He runs away. He has 40 years out in the desert where he's tending sheep um, for his father-in-law. And uh, then whilst he's out there doing, uh, tending those sheep, the one day he sees this curious thing of a bush that is burning. Now, that's not unusual. Um, uh, bushes spontaneously ignite. We know about that, don't we, because of all that's in the news at the moment regarding Australia. Uh, but, uh, you know, bushfires, they were not actually an uncommon sight, except this one was different because the bush was burning, it was blazing away, and yet the bush itself was not being consumed. And so Moses went over to look at this curious sight, and he had an encounter with God. And he'd not really had that personal encounter with God before. He knew all about God, no doubt. Um, but he didn't really know him, and it's a very different thing. Uh, I think this is an important point to make today. It's very different to know about God and to know him. It's one thing to know about Jesus, to read about him in the Gospels perhaps, and it's very different to know Jesus personally. And he knew about God. He'd been taught about God since a child. His uh, family had ensured that. But he didn't know God. And out there in the desert, he meets God. And God speaks to him and he says, Moses, I'm calling you. I've got a special task, Moses. Moses, I want to send you back into Egypt, the place where you are still on the wanted posters. And he says, I want you to go right to the very top, to Pharaoh himself. The very man who wants you dead more than anybody else. And I want you to say to him, and make a demand. Let my people go. Let the Israelites free. You're enslaving them. Free them. Let them go. And Moses says, who's going to believe me? I'm this fugitive. You know, they're just going to arrest me. I mean, this is going to be a gift. How do I know that you're sending me? How can I prove it? And God says to him, he says, tell them who has sent you. And that's very often what we do, isn't it? If somebody comes along claiming authority to do something, say, who gave you this authority? Who sent you? Who authorized you to do this? And if it's not an authority that uh, uh, we respect, then we're not going to take any notice of it. Who sent you? And God says to him, I am sent you. Tell them that. Say, I am sent you. And God revealed his name for the first time as I am. Now, the Jews <clears throat> wrote that down um, with four letters um, that they associated with that name. But we uh, often call that uh, either Jehovah or Yahweh. Um, but essentially, it's, it's this word I am. And what does it mean? I am means this it means I'm in the present, I'm current. I'm alive. I am the living God. You see, God is not I was 
or I will be, but I am. The only time that we see God as I was and I will be that I can find at least is in the book of Revelation. And we see it a couple of times there. And there we see that he talks about, um, he says, I am, and I was, and I will be. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And then later on we see in the worship um, that the living creatures get up there and they start to praise the one who was and is and is to come. Um, But notice that when they talk about the one who was and is to come, they also include with that the one who is. So, yes, he was there in the past at the beginning. Yes, he's there at the end of which there really is no end either. But he's always current. So it makes him the living God. Everything else in this world has a beginning, has an end. It passes. But he is living and always will be. And so Jesus picks up this statement and he says, I am the light of the world. Now you might say, but are they not getting a bit oversensitive to the word I am then? I mean, I could say that, you know, I, I am a British person. That doesn't mean to say I'm declaring myself to be God. I, I hope you see that. Um, uh, you know, that, that's no declaration of being God at all, is it? So what about these people? Are, are they not just overreacting when he says, I am Well, no, clearly not, because at the end of chapter 8, we have um, uh, this word. Now, they've got into an argument now. They've moved on from from Moses, and and they're now talking about Father Abraham and the fact that Jesus has claimed God as his father, and they said, we have Abraham as our father. Uh, We can trace our our lineage back to him, back to the one whom, whom God appointed to be the father of the nation. I don't know who you are, they're saying. We don't know who you are at all, but but he's our father. And Jesus says, well, my father's in heaven. I trump you on that. And then look what Jesus says here. Abraham cannot be Jesus' father, and here is the reason why. In verse 58 of chapter 8, I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. And at this point it says, they picked up stones to stone him. Now, why did they do that? Because they knew that he was declaring himself to be the eternal God. And as far as they're concerned, that's blasphemy. That's all the evidence they needed in order to arrest him uh, and to carry him off to a trial. And yet, interestingly, they didn't. It says that he slipped away from them from the temple grounds. They couldn't arrest him because there were a few more problems that even though Jesus had declared himself to be God, in their eyes, <clears throat> he had blasphemed. Um, that was a terrible crime, uh, and uh, many a person would have been arrested and tried before Jesus for saying such things. But the problem is with Jesus saying it is this, that number one is that there were too many people around who would testify that actually he looks just like Messiah. And I don't mean physically, but in his character and in his work. And number two, there was too much evidence all around them of people who would come and testify that Jesus did the things that only surely Messiah can do. And so they said, we need to tread carefully. The people love him. They think he's the Messiah. They're celebrating him as the chosen one. How on earth can we disprove it? In fact, there were various times when they looked at Jesus' miracles and they said, we know he's done the miracles, but we still refuse to believe that is a terrible position to be in. And you know, there are lots of people in this world today who can see the truth of Jesus logically in their heads. They know it's right. And yet they absolutely refuse. That's willful blindness. We will not believe, we will not trust, we will not have anything to do with it, they say. God is light. In John's letters, he lays this out very explicitly. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. 
All the things that he does are right and true and just. All his ways are light. Jesus has already declared that before Abraham was, I am, I'm eternal. Therefore, he says that as God, I was there right at the very beginning. In the beginning was the word. We know that. We looked at that a few weeks ago. Jesus is saying, I was there at the beginning. Therefore, Jesus is also saying, I am the very one who said, let there be light. And light appeared, as recorded in Genesis 1. Let there be light. And it happened. Now Jesus is about to repeat the very same miracle again, only in a very different format. Because he's now declared himself to be the light. And surely the light has to come from light. You cannot give what you don't already have. God already had every power within him. And so he's able to say, let there be light. And physical light appears. And in the same way, an even greater miracle is that when he says, let there be spiritual light, that the eyes of the heart can also be opened too. So Jesus, sufficiently annoying the authorities, um, now he has a point to prove. And so having had this argument with them, walked away from them, he now says, I've declared myself to be the light of the world. Now I'm going to demonstrate myself to be the light of the world. This is where it gets exciting. Because <clears throat> this is where chapter 9 comes in. Now, we don't know exactly um, uh, uh, where this miracle took place, but I am fairly certain, I'm, I'm going to put my neck on the block here. I think this miracle took place at one of the temple gates. You see, in the end of chapter 8, we're told that Jesus, having had this argument with the Pharisees, the Pharisees picking up the stones, Jesus slipped away from the temple grounds. There must have been a huge commotion, almost a riot, I suspect. And somehow, this is the thing about rioting, is that you get a crowd that gets angry and everybody gathers around. I was in Wimbledon just last week and... As I was just walking along outside Centre Court, um, there were two men. I, I, frankly, they were they were drunk, as drunk as anything, and um, they uh, they had this little bit of an argument going on. And uh, one decides to pick a fight with the other one, and he starts getting his fists out, and uh, he's challenging the other guy. And the problem is that he can't actually stand up really. I mean, he's swaying all over the place. I mean, his, his fists are doing this as well. And, um, and at first, I didn't even notice what was going on. I mean, I kind of just heard some guys in the background with some slurred speech. Um, but I'll tell you what grabbed me more than the, the fight itself was actually the crowd that was suddenly coming. And I suddenly thought, well, what's everybody rushing this way for? And suddenly I noticed uh, then, of course, that I'm just walking by these guys, and you've got this guy there. And everybody's gathering around, and of course, that they just think it's funny. Um, uh, you know, they're, they're just, everyone's just laughing their heads off at these two guys there. And they're, they're both sort of on their feet with their fists sort of like this. They're, they're, there's not a hope of doing any damage to either one, not, not with their fists anyway. Um, uh, you know, might have done some more damage in other ways. But, but you know, it's interesting, the crowd that started to gather. And I just kind of pushed on through and, and Lisa and I just headed off. But the thing is, the crowd starts to come. And I think in the temple courts, there, there would have been thousands of people milling around. And as the stones are being picked up and they start shouting and the crowds come and Jesus slips through the crowd and he heads off. As he's leaving the temple, there is the place where the beggars meet. The beggars often found themselves sitting on the temple steps. If we go into the book of Acts, of course, we have that one with the beggar. As Peter and John come in, he's sitting by the gate called Beautiful, begging there. But beggars met at the temple, and they met in other places too, that's true. But beggars often went to the temple, and it was a good place to go. And number one, there were lots of people coming in, so that, that, that's a good reason. 
Um, number two is that the people that are coming in um, are, are usually very mindful of why they're coming to the temple. It might have been the morning or the evening prayers. They're coming to confess their sins and to ask God's forgiveness. So they're very much aware of their sins. And as we're going to see in just a moment, there was a great association between disability and sin. It was a wrong association, but it was an association they made. And maybe somebody coming in who's really aware of their own sin would be compassionate on somebody who's considered as a sinner. Perhaps it was the place where they felt safe to. Uh, I suspect, just like in any society, there's lots of bad guys around. And if they can take advantage of somebody, they will. If you're sitting on a side street and you've got a bit of money there, somebody's going to come along and snatch it away from you. So the temple is a good place to be. And here is this man, born blind, comes to the temple. I don't know how he got there. Perhaps somebody guided him each day, brought him there, sit there and beg. And as Jesus comes out and he's got his disciples with him, we're told that Jesus saw the man. Now, that's an obvious statement that the man did not see Jesus. Now, I just want to say something here, though, about another uh, miracle of healing the blind. Um, You remember the story of Bartimaeus. Now, that happened in a different city. That was in Jericho. And as Jesus was coming along, the crowds were there, and they were cheering, and they're shouting for Jesus. And and Bartimaeus says, what's all the commotion about? He can't see. What's all the commotion about? And somebody said, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And so he called out to Jesus. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. But the only reason that he knew Jesus was coming was because somebody had told him. But this man has not had the advantage of uh, being told that Jesus is approaching. In fact, Jesus is slipping out quietly from the temple. The commotion is still going on inside. And as Jesus comes out, he spots the man. Now, I I might not be uh, sticking strictly here to uh, what the Bible tells me, but I am going to do a very dangerous thing and make an assumption here. And the assumption is this, that he was not the only beggar in the vicinity. I'm sure he was not the only beggar. And yet Jesus picked him out. And Jesus did that sometimes. Remember when Jesus went to the pool of Bethesda, John chapter 5. The pool at Bethesda, it was actually two pools, really, side by side. And uh, the lame and, and, and the sick, they used to gather all around the outside and up the middle of the two pools, waiting for the bubbles to come up. As, uh, as the water came in, sometimes the air got trapped into the supply and it caused the bubbles. But they thought it was the angel of God and that whoever dived into the water first was healed. That was, that was their, their thinking. But why is it that Jesus walked into that place that must have had hundreds of sick people and he just picked one man and healed him and not all the others? That's God's sovereignty. And here, Jesus, so I'm sure there are others too, but Jesus comes along and he picks on the one man. He sees the one man. Now, bearing in mind that inside the temple, they've got stones and they're looking to stone him. And now the Pharisees are saying, where did he go? Where did he go? Which, did anybody see which direction he went in? You'd think that Jesus would be like running a mile at this time. Saying, come on, quick, get out of here. Forget the sick man. We can deal with the sick later. Let's just get out of here. But he doesn't. Jesus shows interest in the blind man. And his disciples ask a question because he's obviously paused at this point. And the disciples ask a question. And it's a common question that people would ask. Seeing a man who is blind from birth or lame, or deaf, or dumb, or whatever it might be, seeing a man who has a physical ailment, they ask this question. Rabbi, who sinned? Is it this man, or is it his parents that he was born blind? And you might think, that's a really judgmental thing to say, isn't it? But you know, that was the teaching of the day. 
And it was largely a, a misinformation that they had. It comes really from uh, Exodus chapter 20, verse 5. Where there in Exodus 20, verse 5, you, you may know that that's, that's the, the giving of the, the, the Ten Commandments. But in there, it talks about the sins of the fathers being visited on the children to the third and the fourth generation. So they assumed and said that either this man himself had sinned or his parents or grandparents or great-grandparents even had sinned. And as a result of it, the judgment of God was upon him and therefore he's blind. In fact, the Pharisees even show that they uh, accept that teaching. Because you notice that when um, they're uh, questioning the man about um, uh, uh, who healed him, <coughs> staking in chapter 9, in verse 34, when he's challenged them and says, you know, do you want to become his disciple and, and all the rest of it? And then he even says, you know, we know that no one can do a miracle except that God is with him. Therefore, if this man is not who he claims to be, if he's not really God, then, I, you know, and doesn't have God with him, then how on earth does he do the miracles? You explain it to me. He says, you're, you're the clever ones. You explain it. And they're really angry with him. And this is what they say in verse 34. They replied to him, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? They say the reason that you were blind was because of your sin. How dare you come to us who have no physical imperfections and therefore obviously weren't sinners? How dare you do that? But they've completely misunderstood the text. And you know, um, Exodus 20 is not the only place where this is recorded. Um, uh, throughout um, the Old Testament, there are various places where it talks about the sins of the fathers being visited on the children. But there are equally places that tell us other things as well. And I just want to quickly turn to Ezekiel 18. Um, there are several passages that would be counter passages, if you like, for this. And I should say that there are some passages within the same books of the Bible, Deuteronomy, for example, that tells us about the sins of the father being visited on the children, but then later on it tells us that each person's responsible for their own sin. But here we have in um, uh, Ezekiel 18, these words here. Here's a saying, a proverb that you have. The fathers eat sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. In other words, the sins of the fathers are visited on the children. As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, you will no longer quote this proverb in Israel. For every living soul belongs to me. The father as well as the son, both alike belong to me. The soul who sins is the one who will die. In other words, and he goes on, I'm not going to read any more. You can go and look at that later on, Ezekiel 18. But in other words, what he's saying is that this is not about the sins of the previous generation visited on the children. God brings this judgment down um, upon them. And yet that is in the text. So let me just spend a very brief moment explaining that, um, and it will be brief, I promise you. Here's the thing, that, that actually we are talking about the fathers here that are mentioned are not literally the father, singular, it's the fathers, plural. And you find in scripture that usually when it speaks about the fathers, plural, it's referring to the national leaders rather than to... Uh, biological fathers and their children. The sins of the fathers, he's saying, your leaders, who should have known better, led you into sin. And it takes several generations then to eradicate the waywardness that they've introduced into the land, in amongst the people, to eradicate that and get it out. And so as a result, God says that I re, uh, remove the blessing from you um, because you're not walking with me. Now that also will translate down then into the nuclear family, into the individual family too. Because if it happens nationally, then 
there must be like a microcosm of that at play too. And here's the microcosm of it. It's, this is basically it. If you have a father who is not a good father and does bad things, that father will teach his children to do the bad things too. And so the child grows up to do exactly the same things that he was taught by the father. And so what he's learned from his parents, so he continues to do. And will probably then teach his children to do the same. In fact, very often it will do that because the grandparents are there to see their grandchildren. And in a very close-knit community, the grandparents would have great influence upon the grandchildren too. And so if you get a really bad father-grandfather, then they're going to start passing on their sin, their ways, their waywardness to the next generation. And so the point about the sins being visited and the judgments that come is because each generation is sinful. Now, if somebody then sees what they've done is wrong and they say we will no longer do that and they turn away from their sin, then God blesses. And so therefore, no longer will you say in Israel, the fathers eat the sour grapes and the, the children's teeth are set on edge. And Jesus saying to his disciples, forget this misteaching that you've had. This is not about the sins of the father being visited on the child. This is nothing that... that, that that, that uh, the parents have done wrong. This is nothing even that the child has done wrong. You know, the rabbis had some bizarre teaching about this as well. Um, uh, one of the rabbis apparently used to teach that if a baby uh, kicks around a lot in the womb, it's obviously a sinful baby, um, and that God's judgment is already on the child. According to what my mother tells me, really there was no hope for me then. Um, so, <clears throat> but Jesus, look, forget that. That, that. That's not true at all. God holds each person responsible. You, here today, as an individual, are responsible for your own actions. You are the one who has to give account before God. You are the one who has to stand before him. You cannot live on a previous generation's faith. You cannot say I'm a Christian because my parents were Christians. You cannot say that I've become a Christian just because everybody in my family followed Jesus. You are responsible before God. And Jesus says, the same with this man. It's not about sin that's been committed. But here, I love this. This man is born blind. For the glory of God. Wow, that's a statement. Why did Jesus pick this man out at this particular point? Because he says this is the moment when the glory of God is going to shine through. In the book of Esther, uh, Mordecai, the uncle, tells Esther one day, he says, perhaps, he says, you came to this royal position for such a time as this. And I think that we could apply the same principle here, that this man, you were born blind and you've had to endure this blindness all your life for such a time as this, because this is the moment that God had set in history when he was going to do something and was going to bring glory to his name. See, notice it's not about the man receiving his sight, although that's wonderful. It's about the glory that God gets. And so God is about to do this wonderful work in his life, bring glory to his name, and he's going to establish himself as being the light of the world through it in an undeniable way. And so Jesus does this thing, and, and it's quite strange, really. He spits. Jesus spat quite a lot. And there are several miracles where Jesus spat and made clay or literally just spat in somebody's eyes a couple of times. I don't know about you, but if anybody spat in my face, I, I wouldn't be too happy with that. Uh, if somebody spat on the ground and, and made some mud and put, I wouldn't be happy with that either. Um, but notice how receptive this man, he doesn't even know who Jesus is. And I suggest this shows actually how downtrodden the man was. 
Some have argued that, well, spitting in those days wasn't quite so uns uh, socially unacceptable as it is today. I disagree with that. One of the things we told they did to Jesus in mocking him was they spat on him. It was the height of insult. They spat on him. It was as dirty and disgusting then as it is now. And yet Jesus uses this. He makes up the clay, puts it on his eyes, and then he tells him to go to Siloam and wash. Many people have tried to give an explanation as to why Jesus did this rather strange act. I'm not sure I actually know the answer to it. Um, I've, I've read some very interesting and some slightly amusing ones, um, but I'm not going to regale you with the stories that they've come up with just to say that they're all pretty fanciful. I don't think anybody really knows. But there's an interesting thing that I heard today, and I, I've not heard this said before, but um, the more I think about it, the more I think that there might be a point here. Baptist Union um, president for the coming year is a guy called Yinka, and nobody can pronounce his surname. And uh, I was in a meeting with Yinka on Wednesday, and uh, he said this, and, and uh, I thought that there's something really true in this, I think. He said, we have no theology for the healings of Jesus. And I thought, what does he mean, we have no theology? We have no theology. For the miracles that Jesus did. And then he went to give an example. In actual fact, he gave this very example. He said, why did Jesus spit on the ground, make mud, put it on the man's eyes, and then tell him to go and wash it off? There is nothing in scripture that says that you should do that. There is no theology for why you should have to do something like that. It makes no sense. And you can take many of the miracles that Jesus did, and sometimes he did strange things that seem strange to us. And there is no theology for it. We cannot say, here's a biblical reason why you would do that. It's his sovereignty. I'm going to leave it at that. Unless somebody can give me a better answer. But Jesus did this very strange thing. And he sends him down to the pool, which is named Siloam, which means sent. Jesus sent him. And there's obviously a, a picture in that. And he goes to the Pool of Siloam, and the Pool of Siloam was meant to be a place of, of blessing for the city. Siloam is mentioned infrequently in Scripture, but it is mentioned in Isaiah, but not as Siloam. It comes under a slightly different name in Shiloh. And there he talks about the waters of Shiloh, the gentle flowing waters of Shiloh, which were meant to be a comfort to you. He says, instead, you have a torrent from the Euphrates coming down, meaning the king of Assyria is coming. So the pool has been there for a long time. We know that it was next to the king's garden. Nehemiah tells us that. So I wouldn't be at all surprised if this was the water supply for the king's household. It was also the water supply that they used at the Feast of Tabernacles, when on the last and the greatest day of the feast, they used to come with a great uh, pitcher of water, um, and uh, they would pour it out on the altar. The water always came from the pool of Siloam. So it was significant to them. It was an important pool. And Jesus says, I want you to go to the pool that is called Sent, the pool that is meant to be a blessing for the city, the pool that is the source of your water, if you like, the source of life. Go there and wash. Wash the dirt out of your eyes. And as he does so, he will see again. Because this living water, remember it's a gentle flowing water. It's a living water, a spring. The living water brings the life back to the man. And he can see again. And there are so many people. So many people. Maybe there are even people here today who are going around in a blindness, it might not be a physical blindness, but a spiritual blindness, deep inside. <clears throat> you might know lots of different things. The Pharisees knew lots of different things. We're disciples of Moses. We're his uh, followers, and we're the children of Abraham. We know where we've come from. We know the law that we stick to. And yet they had no life in them. 
Jesus described them in another place. He says, you're just like a grave with just a bit of whitewash on the outside, makes it look pretty. But inside, you're stinking, rotting flesh. And here, this man, he says to him, I want you to go. He says, I've picked you, I've chosen you. I'm giving you the opportunity for life. All you have to do is be obedient. Even though what I'm going to ask you to do might sound bizarre. Even though what I'm going to do looks disgusting. I want you just to go with me. Do what I tell you to do. Walk in absolute obedience and you will see. And indeed he does. Jesus, when he was beginning his ministry, or fairly close to the beginning, he went into the synagogue one day, recorded in Luke 4. He goes into the synagogue and he opens the scroll and he opens it to Isaiah 61. And he begins to read from Isaiah 61 and as he reads there, he reads about himself and he says to them, today in your presence, he says, you have seen this prophecy fulfilled. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me, he's anointed me to preach good news to, to the poor, to open the eyes of the blind. And what Jesus is doing here in physically opening the eyes of the blind is he's giving a picture of what it means spiritually to have their eyes opened. He says there are religious leaders all around you, but they're all blind. They're all in darkness. But I come to bring light. Now he says to his disciples, as long as it is daytime, we, I like that, we, not me, but we must do the work my father has sent me to do. He says we have lots of people to go and to open the eyes of the blind for. We have lots of people to help them to see. And as Jesus went about his ministry and as he passed that on to another generation and subsequently it comes down to us, we're still in this point where we're opening the eyes of the blind. And that's only possible when God is at work in our hearts. These other people were blind. The Pharisees were blind. In fact, they even challenged Jesus on that. And they asked him at one point, are you saying that we're blind too? And they were indignant about that. And Jesus is saying to them, yeah, you're blind. You can't see. I want to ask you the question. I know you were born blind, spiritually speaking. We were all born blind, spiritually speaking. Has Jesus opened your eyes? I know, a, or knew, he's dead now, but I knew a lovely man who was blind, been blind all his life. The thing that amazed me when we were younger and we used to listen to him, that even though he had never seen in his life, he had an amazing perception of the world around him. He was able to describe things. He was able to tell you about things that he had never seen. I remember saying to him one day, Taffy, how can you possibly know about these things? He said to me, he said, your eyes are just one way of seeing the world. There are other ways of seeing the world, of knowing it too. But you know, one thing that I guarantee, and that's this, that no matter how much a blind person who's been born blind never seen anything, no matter how much they might know about this world from feel and touch and taste and hearing and descriptions that they've listened to and imagined in their minds, nothing but nothing but nothing beats actually seeing for yourself. And there are lots of Christians who are blind who know the right things, they can describe the Christian faith but they don't really know it. They've never seen it for themselves. They've heard about Jesus. They know about Jesus, but they've never seen him. And I want to say to you today that if you're one of those people who's never seen Jesus, then make it your heart's desire to say, that's what I want more than anything else. Seek help for your blindness. Because seeing, as they say, is believing. 
I know that's a bit of a cliche. But that's what happened with this man. Well, let me just finish with this point. Moving on in the story, when Jesus found the man, he says, do you believe in the Son of Man? That was a title, Jesus' favorite title for himself. It was also a title that was uh, for uh, uh, God, the Son of God. <clears throat> he says, do you believe in him? Well, you better tell me who he is, says the blind man, who can now see. He says, you're looking at him. And I want to say to you that sometimes, you know, we have to have our eyes opened before we truly realize who we're looking at. Sometimes Jesus opens our eyes and we see him and then we discover him. Then we realize that it was he who made the difference in our lives. It was he who transformed us. What is the result of that when you realize who made the difference in your life? Well, the man, it says, worshipped Jesus. And your response, when you can see, when you see Jesus, when your eyes have been opened, and you realize it was him who opened them, your response is to worship him with all your heart. And if you long to worship him and to give him glory, then that is one of the great signs that your eyes are now full of light. Jesus indeed becomes the light of the world to bring sight to the blind, to bring light to those who are in darkness. Has he brought light to you yet?